Okay, so let's get started. I show you how to actually make this specific template in a different video. So make sure to check down below for the link. Like pretty much all materials we're gonna make are shape node. So I'll add a shape node here, and this is going to drive pretty much the entirety of this material. Now it's going to be really kind of split across two different shape nodes, but we'll get to that in a second. So once I've got this plugged in, I'll just right click and drag into our view here. So we're gonna be viewing our base material. And to start this off, I wanna go ahead and define kind of just like the long spindly shape that we would get for a cobweb. And so with our shape node, let's go ahead and bring the Y size down to 0 0.01. Right, so we're just gonna get this thin beam here. And so what I wanna do with this is actually just start to define the kind of initial arching shape of the cobweb as it kind of works towards uh, the center piece there. And I'll probably have something overlaid in this part anyway, so you can better visualize what I'm talking about. So to do that, let's go ahead and add a warp node, or at more specifically, a directional warp node. And we're gonna need a shape to actually start to bend this, right? And I wanna bend it kind of in the center piece. So let's go and add another shape node. And the shape that I want to use is going to be, well, one, it's going to be round and it's going to have a softer fall off. And so the shape we can use for that is going to be the bell option. Now we could use the paraboloid, but you can see it doesn't have quite as soft of a fall off. It's a little bit harsher. So I like to go ahead and just use bell. It's a little bit softer from the edges. So if we look at our directional warp, we're gonna notice that it's not gonna do anything. And that's because we haven't actually changed the warp angle yet. But if I go ahead and move this, now all of a sudden we're actually going to be able to warp and kind of move this, you know, bend up or down, right? Because if I move it left or right, well, it's not really gonna do anything because it's just one straight line there. Even though it technically is warping it, it's just we can't see it. So let's warp it downwards, which is gonna be 270 degrees, right? Because if we're warping left, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, gives us 270. But I'm gonna to have to go and alter our bell just a little bit because I don't want it to be uh, you know, pretty straight and then kind of have this little dinkly uh, you know, or dinky warp there and then come back in, right? Because this is what it's gonna look like. It's gonna look kind of cool actually, but not exactly the shape I want. So let's add a transformation 2D node. And what I want to do is just scale this out on the uh, X axis here. So I'm going to make sure we're viewing that. I'm going to actually I'll hit spacebar to be able to view everything here. And I'm going to hold down control and then shift this out a little bit. And so it's going to be a bit of a guessing game right now. But once we go ahead and tile it, it'll be a lot more visible. And finally, with our directional warp, let's go and just intensify this to something like 50 so that the loop is actually going to be, or the warp is going to be a little bit stronger there. So we're gonna get something kind of like that. So that's looking pretty cool. Now let's go ahead and just actually start to tile it so that we can kind of see what it's gonna look like in our cobweb shape. So you might initially wanna go ahead and use a tile sampler or a tile generator, um, but that's going to just tile it in a very grid-like fashion, right? And that's not how cobwebs work. They're actually more uh, circular or cylindrical. So a node that we could use is going to be the, if I take a look here, the splatter circular node. And go ahead and make sure to plug this into our pattern input. And I'll just come under pattern and change it to our input pattern. So now we're going to get this in a circular pattern. And that's kind of really half the battle right there. Now we just have to go ahead and add some dimension to this. So let's bring the pattern amount up to maybe around like 18. Give it a little bit more, right? They're gonna be uh, kind of overlapping or touching there. But now we need to actually give this multiple layers or what this specific node likes to call rings. And you can see as I bring this up, right, we're gonna get more rings. We could do something really dense like 15. And it's not gonna look good right now, but we're gonna play around with a few things to make 15 rings actually look good. Let's keep going down. 
And under radius, I want to go ahead and change the radius to be maybe like 0 0.45. That's looking okay. And that's all I really want to change for the position. And let's go and bring the scale up to 1.6-ish. So that now we're actually going to get um, some connection and overlap there. We can also go ahead and scale by ring number so that it's going to actually kind of uh, ensure that the smaller areas right kind of towards the center aren't going to be as largely scaled as the outer areas. So we can bring that up. Uh, but you see it's going to do the inverse. So let's just go and invert the ring number there. But we're going to get something kind of like that where they're all going to connect nice and easily with each other. So we're going to get this kind of um, repeating ring pattern. And so far that's looking pretty good for our cobweb. Now let's go ahead and actually add some of those uh, kind of like extrusions from the centerpiece there, which would actually make this cobweb pattern feasible because uh, right now it doesn't really make any sense, right? We're just having like multiple levels of rings. We actually need to kind of divide those up. So let's go and add another shape node. And this time I'm going to make it very slender, but I'm going to make it slender vertically. Let's go and change the X down to something really, really small, like 0 0.0025. Uh, and so small indeed that uh, you can't actually really see it at that uh, zoom layer or zoom level, right? But it's very, very small. And what I want to do with this is we're going to do pretty much the exact same, where I'm going to add a splatter circular. And we make sure that it's our image input. Right, and we're just going to kind of mimic or replicate uh, some of the features of this splatter circular. I'm going to just blend these together first so that we can actually see what's going on. And we're going to use the screen blend mode. Cool, so now we can kind of see what's going on. Uh, but right now we're going to have these pieces actually kind of intersecting in the wrong areas, right? We need them to intersect at each one of these connections. And that's going to be the exact same pattern amount as we had for our splatter circular. And in our case, it was 18. So let's go and change this to 18. But we're going to notice that um, it's not going to be ideal, right? Because it's going to basically show up where the pattern is, not the intersections. So with our top splatter circular, what we can do is come down to our rotation. And we have two options for rotation one is for the pattern itself. And one is for the actual ring. So let's just rotate this about 10 degrees, I think was a good number here. If we take a look, right, it's going to be right down in the center of all these intersections. So 10 is pretty good. And let's come back up to the size here. It's looking a little bit small. So I want to just increase the size on the Y, right, which is going to basically increase the length of these pieces here. Let's bring the Y up to like 0 0.5, which is going to help it stretch all the way out uh, right off to the, you know, the corners of these pieces. And now it's actually looking a little bit more viable of a design. And now we might notice that, uh, yeah, like some of these are going to tile off onto the other side there. Maybe we can bring this down to like 0.45, just so that we're not getting anything tiling off our texture set. And immediately that's already starting to look pretty good, but we might notice um, we're not quite getting, you know, a connection right in the center there. So let's go and bring our radius down just a touch. So maybe, yeah, let's try 0.22. Actually, we'll do 0.24, only because you'll notice that when I bring the radius in, it actually starts to bring it in here as well. So let's go and bring our Y back up and try and kind of split the difference there. Yeah, so I think a radius of about uh, 0 0.24 and a Y of 0 0.48 is probably going to be exactly what we're looking for there. Now before I go ahead and really get into uh, making this obviously look a little bit more web-like, I want to go ahead and play around with our patterns because right now this is very, very uniform and very not uh, realistic to what a cobweb would actually be, right? You'd be missing some of these connections. Uh, it could be a little bit sloppy or a little bit lazy in some areas, right? 
Maybe it's the spider's day off, who really knows? And we'll quickly find out that the splatter circular node doesn't really have a lot of options for, uh, you know, kind of like altering or randomizing each one of these uh, rings and patterns. But what we can do is feed into it different patterns themselves, which we can actually go ahead and manually offset. So let's just take a look back here with our initial directional warp. And we'll notice that with this splatter circular, I can actually go and change the pattern input number. Let's bring this up to three. Now, all of a sudden, you can really see exactly what our pattern is, right? It's just one of these patterns that we have defined here, and it's splayed outwards and then ring. So I can go ahead and very easily add a transformation 2D node, and I'll go ahead and duplicate that. And let's go ahead and just plug both of these back in to our inputs. So really nothing too different, right? But now if I go ahead and say move one of these down on the Y or move it up, now you can see that I'm actually going to go ahead and slightly provide a bit of an offset to these patterns here. So that we're not just going to get like this kind of perfect web. Now, if you wanted the perfect web, you can totally skip this part. But if you want to add a little bit more variety to it, this is going to be really a good way to do that. And actually, I don't like, I just want to be a little bit offset here. And yeah, I think that's going to be okay to kind of just randomize it a little bit, right? So that we're not going to get like perfect one to one across our entire thing. Now, another way that we can really go and randomize this is if we come back into the splatter circular and we scroll all the way down to our color options, we're going to have this random mask option. And very quickly now I can go ahead and actually get rid of various areas throughout our entire piece. And that's going to be really cool. I want to bring this really kind of something a little bit low, like maybe 0.05. Uh, just so that we're still getting a lot of web. So now that we've got that pattern all situated, let's go ahead and kind of destroy it a little bit. Let's add just kind of some general waviness and warpiness to uh, some of the patterns here and just some general disorder. And I'll do that in the form of a directional warp. And again, we're gonna be using a Gaussian noise, my absolute favorite node. So we can see exactly what it's gonna do is just kind of destroy our nice and pristine pattern here. Let's go and bring the scale down to 25. I want something a little bit larger. I'll just plop the disorder somewhere random. And with our directional warp, let's bring the intensity down to three. I don't want it to be like very overpowering. And let's change the degrees to 90. So we're gonna get something a little bit kind of wavy like this, right? It was once very straight. So this is gonna look a little bit more uh, organic, we'll say. Now this next warp is gonna be really cool, and it's one that I am still kind of becoming acquainted to. I haven't really used it a ton in my own work, and I actually only kind of accidentally stumbled upon it in this particular material when I was kind of doing something for fun, and it actually worked out really well. So that is going to be the multi-directional warp grayscale. So it's gonna do pretty much exactly that. And again, I'm gonna go and add a Gaussian noise. And you can see what it does is it, it warps your information, but it kind of warps it at different levels and in different ways. So it kind of makes, you know, like string-like uh, information from this, you know, it kind of almost looks like spaghetti or something. And if we take a look at the image here, right, it actually looks really, really cool, and it works very well for this specific kind of material. Now, I'll give it that it's a little bit strong. Now, you might like it being this strong, which looks kind of cool, uh, but I want to really dial it back in. However, first, let's go ahead and bring this up to like 55. Really, really tiny stuff. And I'm going to use a high-pass grayscale. So I'm going to really limit the grayscale information that I'm going to feed into this node. Let's bring the radius down to like 2.75, right? So it really dials that back. And I'm also gonna bring the intensity down to seven. 
So it's going to be just a little bit, uh, you know, not as intense. But we can see that it still looks really, really cool. And you might want to dial up or dial down the intensity depending on the look you're going to go for. But this is a really cool node to go ahead and play with. Because you'll see we actually even have other options like other modes, right, which are going to do different things. And you might find, you know, like a specific use case for these. But I think average is going to be pretty good for what we want. And finally, let's go ahead and just, again, do kind of like a global warp. Actually, what I'll do is bring everything back, give ourselves some more room. And I'm just going to use a general warp node this time, kind of break things up a little bit again. And let's go ahead and use one final Gaussian noise. So for this one, I want it to be really, really large scale information. So I don't want it to be super small here. So let's bring this down to like 10, play around with the disorder. And let's change the warp intensity down. Uh, one is very, very intense. As you can see, it's almost starting to look really abstract. Well, actually, that does look kind of cool. But yeah, I don't really like how it's kind of almost like warping it into like a black hole kind of look. I don't know. I just don't think it looks too good. I'm going to do around 0 0.35. And then again, we can rely on our disorder, kind of change that up if we don't really like the look quite yet. But I think that's going to be pretty cool. And now because this material does have opacity technically just because of what it is, here is the obligatory opacity output. So I've gone ahead and created a new output. Just call this opacity, opacity here. And let's make sure that it's using the opacity uh, usage. So go and find opacity. And now where I want to draw this information from is just going to be our warp node here. And I want to make sure that I'm going to use a histogram scan node. Now in newer versions of Substance Designer, I believe there's a threshold node. Uh, but as you can see, I'm still using 2019. So don't have that yet. So let's bring this down and plug this in. And I'm going to right click and view outputs in 3D. And let's go ahead with our histogram scan or our threshold and just start to find some of our pattern here. Now we can bring the contrast up if we want to kind of really make it a little bit sharper. I think kind of leaving the contrast down is going to be really cool. It makes it look a little bit wispier, like, you know, cobweb is. And we can just try and play around with how much we actually want. As well, you'll notice that some areas are pretty much pure white, um, but with kind of like web, you know, and cobweb and such, because it's so thin and kind of like the silky material that it is, um, oftentimes it's kind of translucent almost. So what we can do is also run this through a levels node, and I'll just bring the white values down a little bit. So now I'm even actually saying that what we're actually finding this information is also going to be like pseudo transparent or translucent at least. So you can play around with those and find something that works for you. But this is really going to be a pretty easy setup for cobweb materials. So oh, very quickly, that's been a cobweb height map or material. I hope you liked it and learned a few tips and tricks. I certainly was interested with the multi-directional uh, warp grayscale node. That was kind of a nice, pleasant surprise. And it's probably going to be one that you're going to want to use for a lot of those like string or wire kind of materials where you want things to kind of just warp and look a little bit frayed or something like that. So again, thanks for checking it out. Make sure to let me know if there's any kind of materials that you're having trouble starting with the height map. Make sure to share this with a friend if you thought it was helpful. And I'll see you in the next tutorial.